Thank you all very much. I can feel the energy. Can you feel it? Can you see it? Can you hear it? UNC family and friends and others, because I know they listen to us every time we speak. Because before the night ends, during the night, when we leave here, I see them on the Facebook commenting, talking, belly boiling, because they are afraid. When you do wrong, you know you've done wrong, you've done wrong, and you will always be afraid because you will be exposed. So UNC family and friends and others, I say good evening to you. Good evening, good evening. Good evening to all of you. Let me commend our young counselors who have been sharing with us tonight, Kimmy and Krishna. Let me comment on and commend the brilliant lineup of speakers here tonight. MP Saddam Hussein. Saddam, we had a joke, you know, when we first met us, he's a young lawyer, you know, he said, yes, my name is Saddam, but not that Saddam. I'm the Trinidad Saddam Hussein, and he's proud of his name and proud of who he is. I'm proud of Saddam, give him a round of applause. Let me also commend, boy, you can't stop him. Andy Roberts, our senator. I cannot say as much as we'd like to say about Daniel, but he's a great human being, and I'm proud of him too, UNC and proud. Well, what can I say about our other speaker, Dr. Munilal? If it's one thing, you don't lose interest when he's speaking. Sometimes your air turns off a little, and then one word. I said tonight, well done, Dr. Munilal. Proud of you too. I said that was a bodo, like knockout punch tonight. And of course, my sister, uh, Senator Jillian John, brilliant, hardworking, dedicated. I'm so proud of her. And whilst I congratulate all our speakers here tonight and all of you who have joined us, I want to say a word. We've just come out of the Senate, as you know, and before that, out of the House, where the debate on the budget took place. And every single UNC member of Parliament every single senator contributing to that debate. They were so brilliant in prosecuting the case on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. And in that debate, and in that budget, the government blatantly demonstrated their contempt for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. They brought no ideas for growth. They brought no plans for creating jobs. They brought no plans for revenue streams, money. You have to get money to create jobs, to run a country. No plans. Instead, what did they do? Instead of a blueprint to move our nation into the future, they want to take us backwards. And that's how they always govern, you know. They govern watching in the review mirror. They will talk about things that happened under the partnership years ago with all this bacchanal going on in the country, and with so much pain and suffering in the country, this man, Keith Christopher Rowley, jumps on a platform and talks about some alutrint. Well, it didn't even last in the news. We are one day, somebody, alutrint and the partnership shut down the project. Hey, whose project was that? That was a Manning p and project. And when we came into office, the court had ruled that the CEC was not valid, so the project could not go forward. But they are so in the rearview mirror, so backward, never forward thinking. They cannot get out of us, out of our, their thoughts. They can't take us out. I saw a gentleman who really does write very nicely about the UNC and me in the newspaper on the weekend, a columnist. He said that Kamala is occupying space in Rowley Brain rent free. <laughs> they are so preoccupied with us, obsessed. Because they know at the end of the day, as Jillian tell us, you don't know what is the day until you come to the evening. At the end of the day, the partnership government, the UNC-led partnership government is the best that this country has ever had. <laughs> best that we have. So they're always looking backwards, never forward. And just when you think the budget of betrayals was the worst thing the PNM could do, we now have this sordid affair. It sounds so mild to... I see people say Nelson Gate and Farris Gate and so on. Whatever it is, whatever happened, 
That is a scandal of the highest order that stinks to high heavens. That was and is the biggest scandal to ever hit this country in all the years of the nation of Trinidad and Tobago. That is the worst you can see where people in high office use your taxpayers' dollars, use the resources of the state to persecute and prosecute people because of political spite, malice, and ill will. And what it is also, they're just jealous of Ramdina Ramlogan, you know. Faris could tell you which case he ever win him. I win case against Faris. He could ever tell you? No. But those guys have a lineup of cases they've won and will continue to win. So there's also that petty jealousy in addition to the malice, spite, and ill will on the part of persons who will do anything to hold on to power. That's what that is, to hold on to political power. And as the entire nation knows, as we all know in that budget of betrayals, Rowley told us that the country cannot subsidize fuel. Raise the price again. How many times have raised the price of fuel in this country? They cannot subsidize fuel for the poor, for the vulnerable, for the working class, the middle class. But they had millions to pay to a fraudster known as Vincent Nelson. Millions of your dollars. It's all over the newspapers. I think all weekend, all week, that's all over. Everything is out there. As they say, what happens in the dark always comes to light. And so when it comes to persecuting, when it comes to working people in this country, they have no money. They cut down the food cards. They cut down the laptops. They cut down everything that is for the benefit of the vulnerable in our country. But billions being paid to their lawyer friends. Billions being paid, and we'll come back to that. I'll come back to that. So the information over this weekend clearly points to a conspiracy on the part of high-ranking PNM officials and others have spoken to erode the rule of law, to erode the constitution, to erode our democracy, and to bring a nation on its knees. That is their aim, so that they could stay where well, really up in, in charge. Stay in power, that's what it is. So they've broken every rule of law. They've tampered and trampled upon and trespassed upon the Constitution, which is a fundamental doctrine for separation of powers. Fundamental doctrine for assuring that you have your rights. Your family have their rights. We all have rights based on our Constitution. It tells us this is the sovereign law of the land. And the Supreme Court is the guardian of the Constitution. And we'll come back to that again. Because every institution, I told you, has been trampled upon, trespassed, damaged. It seems as though they're hell-bent on destroying the nation we know as Trinidad and Tobago. And now I'm saying to you, Mr. Rowling, you cannot lie your way out of this mess now. Not again. You cannot do it. We will not stand for it. We'll continue to expose you. We'll continue. And this matter, my friends, is no longer about Ramdeen and Ram Logan, you know. Please understand that, you know. Don't get carried away, you know. It is no longer about Anna and Ram Logan and Gerald. And this is about the PNM government. They have no qualms about breaking the law. They will not pause for cause. They will trample, as I say, on our independence and our justice system to persecute their enemies. So it's not about Anna and Gerald. It's about every one of us. It is about all of the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Tomorrow it could be you. Tomorrow it could be a journalist. Tomorrow it could be an editor. Tomorrow it could be a policeman. Tomorrow it could be a taxi driver. It could be any person in this land because they do not care as long as they hold on to power. That is what it is for them. They do not see governance about being for the people, of the people, and by the people. For them, governance is the power and the dollars. A fistful of dollars for their friends and their families and their financiers. So listen, it could be, as we have seen, the police service commission. It could be a pundit, an imam, or a priest. I want you to understand that anyone who speaks a language different from them, or when I say a language, speaks the truth, or speaks a different opinion, they will come for you. It could be a student outside the gates of UWI protesting. It could be anyone. Anyone and everyone in danger now from a wicked and evil PNM government. Wicked and evil. 
Let's look at the timeline on the crime. Can we look at that? Yeah. Many have spoken. But I think people get sometimes, there's so many agreements and deals that went down, people get a little confused. So let's first understand, we have three kinds of agreements, if you want to call them. You have the indemnity. We heard about that, we read about it, that's one. Then there was a plea bargain deal. Yes. And then you have a third one now, the civil claim in the courts. So I think um, one of you said it tonight. This all began way back when, when uh, Nelson was doing legal briefs for the government of Trinidad and Tobago under the, the partnership. When the government changed, they refused to pay Nelson outstanding fees. Refused to pay because maybe even then they had hatched this conspiracy. And so what they did, Nelson filed a matter in court. Who was his lawyer? The fellow who supposedly bought the Porsche, K. Well Singh and others. So he filed for $10 million in backwards legal fees from the 2010 to 15 period. They went to court. There was a preliminary point that was taken and they won the point, Nelson and his team. And then the state, now who is the state? Faris Arawi, the AG, appealed the matter. And whilst the appeal is pending, Faris going down by K. Wallace House, as others told you, for what? To broker this conspiracy and this deal. To tell K. Wallace and to offer to Nelson, listen fellas, if, K if Nelson will come and make statements against Ram Dean and Ram Logan, you know what? We will pay you. That's the first point. So what did they do? They withdrew the appeal and paid him the $10 million. And return, in return, they broke the indemnity which came first. We will indemnify you, you come and tell your lies about these fellows, so we could prosecute them in a criminal court. But the man said, look, I don't trust you guys, you know, and he's very right not to trust them. Set of crooks, all of them, everyone. Hustlers and crooks, all of them. Yeah, and he might be one too. He might be one. I'll give him that, he might be. So, he said, no, 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 you have to indemnify me. I will give you a notarized statement. And this is the third document I'm speaking of. So people know of the indemnity. Then you have the notarized statement. And then in the end, then you had the plea bargain. Do you understand me? So it's three different things. So I saw even today in one of the um, reports, they mixed up the indemnity with the notarized statement. So he said, okay, I'll do a notarized statement. I'll set out all these things there. This one told me who told me what and where and when. Now here, say this and them say. He does the notarized statement. He says, but I'm not going to give you this. And what happens? Indemnity kicks in. And indemnity, you know, all that Faris didn't give that man in that indemnity was his Porsche. That's the only thing he didn't give him, the Porsche. He gave his lawyer the Porsche instead. Thank you, Kivan. Gave the lawyer the Porsche, that's, that's what it was. So, here we are now. They breached the agreement. Others told you reading, Stuart Young said it wasn't him, and he had a duty or all kind of duty, but he is the one. We know it is Stuart Young who sent the notarized statement to the NCA, the National Criminal Agency in London. So in that, he breached terms of the agreement, indemnity agreement. In that, they had, as I said, indemnify the man. They wouldn't tell the British people nothing. They wouldn't tell anybody locally or foreign. Nowhere they'll tell you nothing. They wouldn't share with the British. They wouldn't share with anybody. What happened? They shared it. He lost his license. What happened after that? Lost his license. He couldn't practice. So he's claiming out damages for loss of income from now until 2028 or something. And the sum of about 12 million, 12 million pounds, 120 million million TT dollars. He's claiming um, indemnity for the taxes because the British say, wait, you collect all this money. You don't know you have to pay tax and them foreigners, they don't make joke with taxes, you know that. You didn't pay your taxes, so now you have to pay taxes. So he's claiming now, through the indemnity, taxes as well. 
I think he's claiming some medicals and I think Rudy told you what? Driver and whatever and whatever and whatever. As I say, everything for us gave the indemnity except, well, you told me he gave the Porsche to the lawyer. That's where the state of play was. And the, state, the case collapsed because DPP now. You know, in every dark cloud, they said there's always a silver lining. And today I am very proud to say that there's always someone or some persons who will stand up for what is right. Isn't that true? The silver lining has been <laughs> that the director of public prosecutions refused, as rightly so, to have any part of this conspiracy. <laughs> and therefore, when the day or the night seems too dark, there is always that silver lining that someone and something, and of course I say God don't sleep, only wears pajamas. And so that time will come. And so the DPP stood up and said, this case cannot continue. It is so heavily compromised. And by whom? By the highest office holders in the land. So what madness, is, madness it is then for this AG, then AG, he has placed you and me and every taxpayer in this country and every citizen of this country at heavy financial exposure and risk because of the matter pending in the court filed by Nelson. Can you believe, do you know who filed that case? In February of this year, the case was filed by none other than another PNM MP. So there's a, in addition to the ones they've named, there's another PNM MP who is a lawyer. That's the Cole Pot man. The Cole Pot man himself. I think he should jump on a bicycle and ride to the nearest police station. Right now, he should just jump on a bicycle. I don't know if the bicycle could hold him, but he could try, he could try. So, Mr. Keith Scotland filed that claim on behalf of Nelson when? In or about February this year. And then, like Nelson smell a rat. So Nelson then sent an email, and I have the copy here, somewhere in May, Nelson sent an email. Let me find it. I think it's interesting for me to read it. He fi yes, yes, I know. Yes, I know. Yes. That's a cold pot man, you know, remember? Backwards ever. So I have this email, a copy of it here. Let me see if the camera could pick it up. Are we getting it? Good. We'll send it to the media, don't worry. If you can't read it, I will read it here for you now. Okay? So this email from Vincent Nelson has his email address. Date, 26 May 2022. To Keith Scotland. Subject, your retainer, Nelson versus AG. And you understand what a retainer is, and Nelson retained him to file a case for him. So in May now, here is this, from Vincent to Keith. Dear Keith, now this is not Keith Rowley, yeah? this is <laughs> Keith Cotton. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we could, we could make sure we don't mix them up. Dear Keith, as you're aware from our many conversations, I have some concerns regarding the conflict of interest you may have in this matter. This concern has grown considerably over the last few weeks. I have therefore decided that it is in my best interests and peace of mind to terminate the retainer with immediate effect. I am in the process of appointing alternative lawyers. They will write to you in the forthcoming days as they are required to do under the Legal Profession Act. I would like to thank you for your efforts on my behalf. Kind regards, Vincent. The person who filed the civil case against Faris Alwari in February this year was none other than Colpot Keith, Scotland. None other. A PNM sitting MP. So it's another one who knew. Another one of them who knew. Then Nelson fired him because he says, I feel you have a conflict of interest. Yes. So since February, 
Mr. Scotland is sitting on this matter, file the matter, then they change the lawyers and so on. We have, uh, they, there are other lawyers in the case now. And why is it that you think Scotland would have filed this matter? I can only, only speculate. And come along with me. Let's speculate together. Keith Scotland is a member of the sitting government. Nelson comes to him and says, listen, I'm man, the fellows who want to pay me my money. They broke the indemnity. Look, I lost my license up in England. I can't practice again. I have no money. So let's put them under some pressure. So Scotland will file it, but say nothing, do nothing, hear no evil, see no evil. And it sits there from February down the road to now when everything exploded and came out in the open. Scotland and I don't, you could tell us, Mr. Scotland, was, was there another conspiracy for you all to put pressure on the Minister of Finance to release monies to pay this man? I don't know the story, you know. I think Rudy told you about it. You don't just spend money like that. You don't just pay out money. And the question comes back, why would they have paid the 6.6 .6 million to Cable Singh and others to go and defend Nelson and what you said, Rudy, when you get somebody get charged, you had to go to court free. This man getting paid to go to court. You get him paid taxpayers your dollars, but they can't find money to give the children food meals, to give laptops, to give they just can't find to help those in need. They help themselves. So Scotland files the case, sits on it, sits on it. And I think that may have been, I'm asking for a friend, I'm just asking, whether that was just to place some pressure. Not on Faris, because Faris knew what he had done. Faris admits he's the one um, involved in making this indemnity. He has admitted openly. Not Faris. For Faris to put pressure on some of his other colleagues to get the money, to pay Nelson, and then case pull back and everything, done. I don't know, Mr. Colpot, we are asking you. I really don't know. So that's, that's what happened then. And now, I saw the, um, I saw the, uh, Express editorial today. And the heading for that, it says, mm. so now we just spoke it. <laughs> Mutually assuring destruction. Mutually assuring destruction. Mad. That's what it means, mad. All of this is pure, total madness going on in the highest offices of the land. And all of this would have remained secret, as I say, if the DPP did not step out and do his duty. Do his duty. So I'm saying the rule of law is the foundation on which any democratic society must rely. An impartial and blind justice system is essential to every democracy. We know that there are many ways, many flaws with our justice system. It is not perfect but it is predicated on universal precepts which cannot be ignored. These include being judged innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. What the PNM has done is undermine the entire justice system to erode all confidence the public has that they can be given a free trial. Because if you could stoop to these lengths to deal with your political Opponents, what do you do for an ordinary person? I know there's somebody, and remind me, there's a minister, they call him um, some worker at Wassa. What did he do to that worker? What? Yes, he persecuted him and asked him to change uh, the evidence on him. Yes. Because he drove around picking fine, he should not drive a pickup. He should not drive a pickup. Ordinary man working at Wassa, persecuted, prosecuted, because some minister didn't like him. And in that case, the silver lining was there, and it was reminding me, the investigator held firm. So that's what they've done. Any government that is willing to break the law, as that former attorney general and his cohorts, is a government that will break any law, that will tell any lie, as I say, to do what? Stay in power. If we allow the PNM to get away with this, then we might as well tear up our constitution you might as well give up your passport and head somewhere else for refuge in some other country. But I'm not leaving. This is my land. I will not leave. And together we will stay and we'll fight this wicked, evil government. We have to do it. We must do it. 
Because if we don't, then what will happen? As the PNM continues to take over or dismantle the judicial system, crime continues to rampage throughout our country. JJ spoke about a young boy, the nine-year-old boy was shot when? In a playground, man. In a playground, you cannot even be safe in a playground. You cannot be safe anywhere. We are almost on track now to about 600 murders for this year. The highest we've ever seen, and I want to boast and say proudly, my government brought down the murder rate to the lowest in decades. We brought it down. And all of this is because the PNM, led by Rowley, his band of jokers, I think JJ called them from the Express Amateurs, they are focused on persecuting the UNC and political opponents, while everybody else is slaughtered in cold blood, in broad delight. A father over this weekend, what did we see? In addition to that nine-year-old child and all our condolences and prayers go to the family. In addition to that child, a father was stabbed and killed in his own home in Gasparillo in front of his wife and children. Drive-by shooting leaves three wounded in Lavandi. A woman was shot in her chest in another drive-by shooting in Dago Martin. And so we can go on and on with this. The numbers and the murders. And hey, by the way, I heard um, JJ mention the late Andrea Barrett. What has happened to the pepper spray? Big hoorah hoorah all over. Then Farris was AG boasting and going and crying. Crocodile tears everywhere. Yes, we bring in the pepper spray. We pass the legislation. Up to today, no pepper spray. Why? Why you allow our women or children or vulnerable to be slaughtered without protection for themselves? Why? No pepper spray. They don't care. They just do not care as long as they hold on to power. That's all they care about, power. What is the TTPS doing? They remain very crippled. That TTPS. I feel sorry for them. Got there are many good officers in that TTPS. You all agree with me? Yeah. Very good officers. But one rotten orange will spoil the whole basket. And so, it is the same interference they're facing. It is the same manipulation from the PNM. They have corrupted this PNM, every single independent institution. Look at the state and quality of our lives now today and tell me, tell me, who is to blame for that? Are you better off today than you were in 2015? Are you better off today than you were during the period 2010 to 2015? Are you better off? No way, no way, no way. You can't be safe, as I say, not even in a playground. And whilst this is taking place, what is the government focused on? Witch hunts. Witch hunts. They are busy spending millions of dollars to persecute and hung down UNC members. Now we've seen their plot backfired right in their face. I know there's such a thing, we all know it, karma. We have seen that the PNM got a taste of that today, karma. When you big hole for other people, remember you're digging hole for yourself. And that is what has happened to this wicked government. They got a taste of karma. So when you dig in that hole, you better <laughs> dig one for yourself. Or dig no hole for anyone. That is the answer. Don't dig no hole for anyone with your lies. My brothers and sisters, as I close tonight, I want to talk to you a little about the word hubris. Can I spell it for you? H-U-B-R-I-S. Hubris. Heard that word before? You know when last I heard it? In the relation to politics? In 2010, when we were challenging then government, 2010, and the Express editorial had written Mr. Selwyn Ryan, great man, by the way, his column, and he talked about hubris. And that has manifested over again now in this wicked evil government. That word is used to describe a person who has extreme or excessive pride or dangerous overconfidence. It is often synonymous with the word arrogance. So hubris, we see hubris all the time in the political arena. As I said, remember when then Prime Minister Patrick Manning, he fired his foreign affairs minister. How? You all remember that? Anybody young enough to remember by facts? That's his hubris. Overconfidence, arrogance. 
Remember when the late PNM Home Affairs Minister Patrick Solomon, he went into the Woodbrook Police Station and removed his stepson who was under arrest. That was hubris. Remember when Shamfa said after the general election that it was their time now, deal with it, we in charge now, deal with it. That was hubris. Remember when Dr. Rowley admitted that he was a high-ranking official who met with the then uh, Police Service Commission Chairman, Blissy Passad at President's House and provided her with information on Gary and got her to pull back the merit list. That was hubris. Remember in 2019, then they, when they were just charged, the two Rams, Ananda Ram and um, Cheryl, what Rowley said? He said he intended to bolt Anand Ram Logan and Gerald Ram Dean onto my chest. I don't know what this fella have with my chest. <laughs> I really don't know what this fella have with my chest, boy. <laughs> so he wants to bolt that onto my chest. Well, experts describe hubris. That was hubris too. That overconfidence, that arrogance. The experts describe hubris as indicating the loss of contact with reality. And we saw that over the budget. We've seen it. They are totally out of touch, disconnected with the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is an exaggeration of their own capability and competence. The PNM is infected with hubris. We are now witnessing the unraveling of this conman PNM regime. In the hate to destroy the two, um, Gerald and uh, Anan, at all costs, they have overstepped, as we said, constitutional boundaries. Their hubris may very well lead to criminal proceedings perverting the course of justice, misbehavior in public office. I think we can throw the whole law book at them. Misconduct in public office at common law. Under statute law, interference and perversion of the course of justice. And I have about 10 more charges, I think, will apply in the circumstances that we have seen. We now have Rowley in his cabinet delaying the selection of deputy commissioners of police. You saw what the PSC put out recently? Then they sent, yes, they sent out um, a press release to explain why they appointed Erla, Miss Erla as the acting commissioner of police. And they said the only person who could act is somebody who is a DCP. She was the only DCP acting as well. Now acting as commissioner in the absence of the Act, oh, another actor. Jacob is also acting commissioner of police. They will not use the law and give people that benefit of having your job secure because what they want to do, they want to interfere. They want to pick and choose so they can control what goes on in some arms of the TTPS. That is what that whole interference with the police service commission is about, to prolong the existence of someone. And now, this thing about the age, <coughs> excuse me, you, you heard him but said it in the budget, and they said they're going to bring something to extend the age of persons in the public service, the retirement age, to 65. That is eerily familiar to me. Because in 2010, when we were fighting the elections then, the then Prime Minister wanted to extend the retirement age for permanent secretaries. And the others in the system, well, no, if you do that, how am I going to climb up? When will I ever get promoted? But that was also an attempt to keep people in positions. Isn't there an acting commissioner of police who already crossed the age? Will you bring that law to keep people in positions, I'm asking you? If you're coming here now to say you're feeling sorry for people, I think if you want to do that, it should be a matter of choice. You should not pass a law to legislate. <laughs> to legislate a retirement age. Because when people began to work, you had what they call in law a legitimate expectation that these are the terms and conditions of my service, that I will work until what age? 60. I haven't reached 60 yet, and you want to come and tell me I have to work five years more? That should be a matter of a person's choice. The government should not be legislating that. So we will look at the constitutionality of doing that. We have brilliant lawyers in the... Um, UNC, don't we? We have very brilliant lawyers. And therefore, we shall be looking into that exercise. You have mismanaged the economy. 
I know you want to, that's why you don't have money to pay people when they retire to get their NIS and whatever else you have, your pensions and so on, so you want to force them to labor. This is not a slave country, you know him, but Master Day done. Master Day is done. And we will fight you on anything that is wrong. So, Stuart Young, in the midst of this internal election, I don't want to worry the election, that is their own, what is called call it? That's their own business. Let them fight each other. In the midst of that, we have two cabinet colleagues apparently engaged in an inside battle against each other. So, the other told you, we confirm, it was Stuart who gave the notarized statement to the UK. Stuart's disclosure unraveled the deal with Nelson. And all chickens have come up to roost in Faris's head. Now, when I told you the case was filed in February by Scotland, at that time, Faris was the Attorney General. After case file, well, everybody knew. What did they do? Move Faris out of the AG's job. Did you think about that? They moved him out because all of them knew. They all knew. As somebody told me tonight, all of you said it. Everyone is guilty. All, 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 all guilty. They're all guilty. Everyone is guilty. So, speaking about Stuart, by the way, I don't know if you've seen a, a story in today's news about the 67 NP gas stations at risk of being shut down. Who is the Minister of Energy? Stuart Young. So here we have the Minister of Energy, same Stuart Young. Since the judge's ruling in May, he has done nothing to regularize the license arrangements of 67 NP service stations. Instead, NP's lawyers, and remember, Stuart is the line minister, they have run to the court like chicken little to say the sky is falling down. There will be disruption to the traveling public if these licenses are not regularized. 67 NP stations. Let us know that Stuart's lawyer in the case before the High Court was guess who? Take a guess, just take a guess. The present Attorney General, Limo. That was his lawyer in the case of the High Court. Now, if this happens, the, these stations are going to be shut down. It is because the minister directed NP to cease supplying those stations with petrol, the ones without the license. The Minister of Energy is in charge of enforcing the Petroleum Act. He has not taken any steps for five months, and now there's a sudden panic when all he has to do is work with NP and the dealers and regularize all of them, even if it means coming to Parliament for validating legislation. As for the Petroleum Dealers Association, they brought the judicial review in the first place by the lead attorney, guess who? Another one of Faris's friends, Fayed Hussein. It has managed to shoot itself, the PDA, by jeopardizing the operations of many of its dealer members. I wonder if that association will be coming to court to say no to suspension and shut all of them down. Expensive and dangerous games are being played in the courts. The PDA targeted the Diego Martin service station and ended up with 67 stations license being deemed unlawful by implication. 67 stations. The minister refuses to fix the situation. He leaves it up to the courts and both sides waiting for the other side to do what? To see who will blink first. Meanwhile, the public continues to pay the legal fees for the ministers and NP's lawyers I know we'll have to worry about where we'll fill the gas station. As we said, the most expensive place he's ever gone is where? Any gas station. To pay these high prices at the gas station. From NP's own affidavit, the government's legal, legal hijinks involving very expensive lawyers and Stuart Young's mismanagement of his portfolio now puts us in a place where the entire country may soon be shut down because of the run on petrol if the six or seven stations do not have petrol. So I'm putting you on notice and cause. NP and Stuart are silent in the face of that report. Again, they don't care about you. They don't care about anybody. Suffer as you may. It has nothing to do with them. And that too is hubris. Their overconfidence, their arrogance, their exaggeration, their belief that they are the only people competent and capable and will listen to nothing else. And whilst I um, 
talk about hubris. I want to talk about the judiciary. I told you I'll come back to the judiciary. I'll just take a few minutes more. The PNM does not care about anyone except for their friends, family, and finances. They will do anything to destroy who they think are their political enemies, using any arm of the state and state resources. Um, could it be the police? Could it be the judiciary? Speaking of hubris, the judiciary now seems to be on a law, be, to be a law unto itself, and I'll tell you why. They told the government why it is unable to comply with the provisions of the Public Procurement Act. You said because they are not adequately staffed. The government is now using that as an excuse to delay putting the act into effect. In the meantime, billions of dollars in corruption without the procurement law is going down. Again, they can't find money to buy laptops. They can't give you the baby grant. Or I gave the baby grant to families in need so they can at least buy milk for their children. They cannot find the money, as I say, to pay the gate for students. They've closed the gate on students, so many things. But what will happen? Billions in corruption going down. Every dollar lost to corruption is one dollar to go on to fix potholes, to fix your roads, your drains, deal with flooding. And so the government is using that to say, okay, we can't proclaim the law. So they could continue with their practices. Government giving the judiciary a blind, and this is a question, to avoid oversight as to how it spends its money may in circumstances be seen by the ordinary person as a favor in return for favorable judgment, judgments. Judiciary, okay, you have no oversight, don't worry, we don't worry about you, go ahead and spend money. And in return, as happened with Nelson and his case, is there some conspiracy? I'm only asking, as I say, always for a friend and for the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Is it that you're giving a lie because you want one back in return? Judicial independence is very important. And so I ask, is the government, by bowing to the judiciary's delaying tactic, making track for Goody to run in exchange for favors? Millions of public dollars are at stake. Perhaps the best example of hubris, and I started with that word, and I'm still on it, is Faris's revelation. I tell you, the fellow so dunce, you know. <laughs> he had to call out two senior counsels, Douglas Menz and Gilbert Peterson. Well, I hope they will break their silence and tell us what happened and how much money they got paid. <laughs> how much were you paid? When Faris tells us Douglas Menz, SC, Gilbert Pieces and SC, eminent senior counsels. They settled an all infamous indemnity agreement, which Nelson and Faris signed. So confident, he's calling out his colleagues. Do you mean he could even settle a document himself? But Faris, you are not going to get bailed out because of SC Gilbert Peterson and SC Douglas Manns. Because at the end of the day, as others said tonight, the buck stops with you. You were the Attorney General. You signed the agreement. And the buck stops with your government and your Prime Minister. All, all, all of you are guilty of this bacchanal and scandal in the country. Shame and scandal. You remember that song? Shame and scandal in the PNM. And so, how much money were they paid? Now, with the greatest respect to the two senior counsels, I do not think that an, op an opinion, <laughs> this will sound funny, but it is funny. Faris is blind now. His defense now is, hey, I didn't do it. It wasn't me. Like Shaggy, it wasn't me. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't me. It's Douglas and Gilbert. But Faris, the fact that an op you have an opinion from Douglas Menz and Gilbert Peterson, whether you got it jointly or severally from the two guys, that is not a defense known to law. It is not a defense in law. You cannot plead, well, look at them fellas, not me. That is not a defense. It is no defense. You have no defense. You are guilty. All of you, guilty. So Faris has, yes, Saf. You can't do that. Let the police do their work first, please. And so... I asked already how much money they were paid. That's important too. You go here and all these millions and zillions. Uh, what Alice says, it, b -b -b billions. Alice says it. 
But is there still more baby billions? How much were they paid? Douglas Mans and Gilbert Peterson and anyone else hiding in the woodwork. We will soon hear about others who have been involved in this matter. I now come to the Law Association. Our friend Douglas Mans, did you know that? Our friend in law, as we say. He is a senior ordinary member and a champion of Trinidad and Tobago replacing the Privy Council with the Caribbean Court of Justice. Always busy talking. So Mr. Douglas Menz, in the face of Nelson Gate, that same law association in the past has criticized everybody. Why are they so quiet today? Why you remain silent as lamb? Silence is not an option in this fiasco. So Douglas Menz is a senior member, a senior member of the law association. And all of this, while the society led by so-called validating and silent elites, and some of you call them out tonight, all of them, if I drop a rainfall, they're out there crying and quarreling and calling out people. Totally silent, the validating elites. Because what? They're all closet PM. Because they all what? Eat a food. Yeah. I said that before here, and people get vexed with me, but I'll repeat it again. Yeah. Eat a food. That's what they are. Ask Reggie Amor how many briefs he got from the state before he became AG here now. Ask the others when the law association brought the motion to deal with um, Limo for lying in, a, in a, a Miami court. Lying, you know. This is an attorney general shame and disgrace to Trinidad and Tobago. When we brought that motion, all these Eater Food senior counsels are crying. Gilbert puts us, oh yeah, I know, I know Reggie Amor, he's a very good boy. Excellent boy. Don't mind he lying thing, he's a good boy. You remember that? You all remember that, you know, eat your food, people. Anyhow, moving along. All the time now, these people are so quiet, silent, and the country and the people are being led like lambs to the slaughter. We are not in a good place as a society. The rule of law has been, is being, will continue to be undermined by this PNM and their minions. Now, the Attorney General, when the case collapsed, when it is, it mash up, it gone, when the DPP made a statement in the court, and what did this, another dunce, Attorney General say, the present one? He said he wanted to bring Ramdina and Ram Logan before the disciplinary committee of the same law association. Like that fellow don't know you, what, what happened there, you can't bring them for disciplinary before they did not do something wrong in law. If you're a lawyer and you do something wrong law, you charge your client too much money, or you teeth your client money, yeah, this many proceedings before law association. Law association is not the body, that's the first point. They have no remit, no power, no jurisdiction to deal with that. But here, this one. Do you know who chairs the disciplinary committee of the law association? You see, it's a whole connecting, interconnected, Gilbert Peterson, senior counsel, is the chairman of the disciplinary committee. And guess what? This is the same Mr. Peterson. I do really go up those places. I think really you go to them less expensive places or more. On the golf course, playing golf with whom? Keith Rowley. Inez Gate, neighbor. Inez Gate neighbor in Tobago. All of them buy these apartments in Inez Gate and so on. So there's a silent commentators. What about the transparency? Somebody remember those people? In, when last you heard them make a comment on anything? They migrated. I think one of them became an ambassador somewhere. You're right. In Jamaica, the man who's the head transparency, they, they buy him out. Sorry, they didn't buy him. I withdraw that word. They send him off to Jamaica. He get a nice send off with salary. Go on. So where are the rest of them? All right-thinking persons in this country must reject this. Look, we have to make our collective voices heard. We have to do it. The time is now, and now is the time. If not now, when? What more will you sit here and stay and play like quiet and afraid and afraid? The time for fear is gone. Now is the time for fight and fight. We must. We must fight. We must fight. We must fight. The rot and stench coming from high offices is not only a UNC problem. 
When you have no gas in your car, no food to feed your children, no job, your home is flooded, you cannot get a bed at a hospital, it is either you take five more years of abuse or decide that enough is enough. The UNC under my leadership is the only government that had put people first, that had governed with respect for all, both those in the north, in the south, in the east, and in the west, and in central. We governed without hubris and without malice and took pains to improve the lives of every single one. So I ask you, Trinan Tobago, do you feel better today than you did under 2010, 2015? I'd ask you before. And I want to warn you, as the Express Editorial has put it, MAD, mutually whatever, assured destruction. That's where we are heading under the PNM, mutually assured, sure, 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 destruction further. So the tentacles of the PNM, they've reached everywhere. I want to warn Rowley and the PNM that winter is indeed coming. We are coming for you politically. Winter is indeed coming. And we will not rest. We will leave no stone unturned. Because you see, as surely as the day follows the night, the sun will rise again. May God bless you all, and I thank you very much. So who feel the black? Who feel the white? I don't know. But it's right till tomorrow night. Who feel the wrong? Who feel the right? Come and go. And all who feel the too bright. Let me jump up. Let me wind up. Party non-stop. Rama Jedingo Lekel Kete, we come to play mass. Every creed and class. Don't let nothing pass. Like a ready TV, all the love inside the way. Up tongue and get to. Feeling the tempo. So current kind so. It's party day like so. Soon as we land, fun is the plan. We like to jam like the man bam. Waving we hand inside the band. We inside the band. And if you cut me, you go see blood. And if you squeeze me, 